When we were together yesterday, I was trying to ease you into the world of Puritan theology. I didn't do a complete job. We have to resume that task today. I wondered at one stage whether I was doing a good job, but that was perhaps more my problem than yours. Anyway, I ask you to come back with me to the world of Puritan theology now, and I'll pull together some of the threads that were thrown out yesterday, and take further some of the lines of thought that are well, we stood that we started yesterday, and that are listed on the outline sheet for this class, the one headed the doctrine of saving grace among the Puritans. Uh, one roots and two fruits. And that, I think, is going to take us the whole of this morning. What is down in the course syllabus? as a study of the assurance of faith, will, I hope, be occupying us during the second hour. Let's see if it works out that way. I never quite know how things are going to go when I start teaching, partly because things grow as I'm saying them, and partly because people ask questions. I remember that yesterday I gave you virtually no chance to ask questions or to discuss. Well, I hope to remedy that today. And, uh, well, if things come out of the hopper that uh, I hadn't expected to find myself saying, I shan't regard that as a disaster today any more than I have done on previous occasions when it's happened. So, hang loose in relation to the outline. Just believe that your professor is doing his best and follow along with what he actually tries to share with you. Okay? The world of Puritan theology is our theme. And we saw yesterday that it's the world of Reformation theology a hundred years on from the pioneer reformers. It was the reformers who gave theology the cast that evangelical theology still has. Prior to the Reformation, theology had been essentially a systematizing and analyzing of the faith of the church as officially defined within the church. From the 16th century onwards, theology was a systematizing and analyzing and expounding of the faith of the scriptures understood by the principle of going first to Paul's letter to the Romans. Why there? Because anyone who reads the Bible through will see all roads in the Bible lead to Romans and from Romans. Romans is a systematic statement that covers just about every biblical theme. And you find people from Luther and William Tyndale and then Calvin, and then all the Puritans who, dealt with, who spoke of this at all, insisting that Romans is in very truth the key to Scripture, and that the way to understand the Bible is to let Romans, and the teaching of Romans, lead you in your study of all the rest of the books. What did that mean? Well, it meant that first you realize you have to focus on the fact of sin. You have to study man under God, first as created, then as fallen. And you have to come to terms with the gravity of the human condition, guilty and powerless in sin. Then, against that background, 
you have to focus on Jesus Christ, the mediator, God who became man in order to become the saviour of sinners. You have to understand his perfect life and his atoning death. And then on that basis you have to proclaim the way of salvation through faith in Christ and the gifts which God gives to those who put faith in Christ and in fact by the Holy Spirit are united with Jesus Christ. The gifts are justification and adoption, reconciliation to God, hope of glory, the gifts, in other words, of present salvation. So, from the study of man in sin under God, you move to the study of God in grace through Jesus Christ, saving man. And then you move to the study of the fellowship of Christians resulting from the grace of the gospel. It's the, that fellowship is the community which we call the church. And you study the church, therefore, as, now this is a Puritan image, the hospital in which God brings together and constantly ministers to those sinners who are getting better by virtue of their being in Christ, they're alive from the dead, and the sinfulness of their nature is being progressively dealt with. They're not well yet. But in the hospital they are cared for, they care for each other, and the work of healing and renewing goes on. So the church is essentially a spiritual fellowship. And then, as the final theme... Um, and here you, uh, uh, here you, you recognise we, we've gone through Romans um, we've gone through Romans right up to the end of chapter 11 and indeed plunged again in the doctrine of the church into chapter 12 and chapters 14 and the beginning of chapter 15 all of which is about the church and then finally you reflect on the fact that the whole New Testament perspective uh, as you see it in Romans and uh, indeed in all the rest of Paul's uh, letters is future oriented. Um, the early Christians were taught to look forward to the Lord's return and to estimate their present life in light of the Lord's return. This perspective is found in Romans just as it's found elsewhere in the New Testament, as I said. Uh, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Christ is returning to complete the work of grace. So, you round off your study of theology, so said the Reformers, with uh, something about eschatology, that is, the Lord's coming and the future hope of believers. The Puritans inherited this way of approaching the task of theological study. They stayed with it. They developed it. But they didn't change its outlines in any serious way. I spoke of Calvin, whose Institutes is a classic statement of Christian theology done from this standpoint. I spoke of Beza, who essentially restated Calvin's doctrine, although at two points he said things in black and white which Calvin had never said in black and white. One point, you'll recall, was that the plan of God began with a desire to have two sorts of people and to that end, to create, to have the race fall into sin, and then to save some out of the mass of sinful humanity. 
That was the supralapsarian understanding of the plan of God, which Calvin, as I said, had never explicitly affirmed, and which most Puritans, um, Perkins being the great exception, most Puritans um, shied back from, and uh, shied back from becoming so infralapsarians and believing that the New Testament took them that way. And then the other point at which Beza was explicit in a way that Calvin had never been, though here he's just drawing out the implications of Calvin's particularism, that is, Calvin's belief that election is God's choice of particular persons to save, and effectual calling, calling that is by the Holy Spirit in the heart that induces faith in Christ, that too is a particular operation which um, occurs in the lives specifically and particularly of God's chosen ones. Um, Beza, in line with that thinking, um, said, and there is a particularism we must acknowledge in the atoning death of Christ. Granted, the gospel invitation is to whosoever will come to Christ, and it's a bona fide promise of acceptance and pardon and renewal if you do come, and that whosoever will gospel is founded on the achievement of Christ on the cross, and there wouldn't be such a message to the world had Christ not died on the cross. In other words, there is a universal aspect to the atonement as well. Beza didn't stress that, but he continued to talk, as Calvin had talked, about the open invitation of God to everyone who hears the gospel um, as it comes as a bona fide invitation uh, as in Jesus' parable, remember, of the Great Supper to which um, all and sundry were invited, um, there must never be any doubt, said Calvin and said Visa, that the promise of God in the Gospel is guaranteed. But then, within that frame, there's a particularity in redemption and the Puritans did pick this up and uh, maintain it. And in Packer's Quest for Godliness, you will find a chapter which began as an introductory essay to the classic treatment of this theme by John Owen in his book called The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. The chapter in uh, A Quest for Godliness is retitled Saved by His Precious Blood. And it's an attempt to show the person who starts from cold how the Puritans reasoned about the particularity of redemption. Actually, when they came to tangle with uh, folk who doubted the particularity of redemption, um, the people I mean who said, as the Arminians did, that Christ died for everybody in general, but nobody in particular, then they said, um, this cuts at the root, the Puritans, the Puritans I'm talking about here, I hope that's clear, the Puritans said, this cuts at the root of the doctrine of justification, because the doctrine of justification is the doctrine of a great exchange, whereby the sinner, putting his faith in Christ, is enabled and indeed directed to say, and indeed let's go back to Luther here because he put this classically in a letter to a friend, uh, where he said, learn to know Christ and him crucified, learn to sing to him and say, Lord Jesus, I am your righteousness, you are my sin. You have taken upon you what was mine, 
and set upon me what was yours. You have become what you were not, that I might become what I was not. Uh, that's an extract from a pastoral letter of Luther to some guy, I can't remember who it was, I'm afraid, um, who had written to Luther moaning about the gravity of his own sins and wondering whether he could ever be forgiven. And this is the advice that Luther gives him. Well, said the reformer, said the, said the Puritans when they came to discuss this, inasmuch as justification is a personal grant from God, we must understand that the atonement on which justification is based is also a particular grant, isn't the word that fits, what should we call it? Um, it's a particular transaction on the part of the Father and the Son with me, the sinner, you, the sinner, personally and individually in view. Christ knew whom he was dying for in this particular sense, and one of the awesome realities for which to all eternity the saints must praise God is that that was so. And we are led in this, as a matter of fact, by the Apostle Paul, as the Puritans pointed out. Paul in uh, Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This particularity leads to an intensity of personal gratitude and devotion to the Lord, um, which ought to be highlighted as part of the Puritan testimony, because the Puritans knew that the more wholeheartedly Christians embrace the fact that from all eternity the Father had loved them individually and uh, Christ had died for each of them individually, well, as I said a moment ago, the more heartfelt will be the praise and the gratitude and the adoration and the wonder of the believer as he or she moves through the wilderness of this world and then takes their place, as by God's grace we all shall do, in the glory that's eternal. Now, I spoke of those things yesterday and uh, mustn't allow myself to go to town about them at length today. I also said, as we closed, that the quest for assurance of salvation, which is down there as the bottom line of the first paragraph headed roots, the quest for assurance of salvation was a big thing among people in the English church to whom the Puritans were ministering. Um, that was because the plan of God, the plan of God for the sinner's salvation, was being taught throughout the Church of England in what we'll have to call Calvinistic terms, although it's really in terms of Romans. And people got over the wrong end of the stick and asked the question, not what must I do to be saved, but how may I know that I'm one of the elect? How may I have assurance at that point? And the Puritans had pastoral devices ready for dealing with that question. Um, I told you yesterday that the first thing they said was, look, you're start, you, are really, you really are starting at the wrong end. What you ought to be doing is seeking a living faith in Christ rather than uh, scratching your head about your election while you sit and do nothing. But now, supposing that you are seeking to be a thoroughgoing believer in Christ, yes, said the Puritans, we understand you still may be uncertain as to whether the Lord has received you. Well, um, 
be assured as to his faithfulness but still after all that uh, you will need to check constantly that what you call your faith your response to Christ is sincere and not hypocritical so yes um, there's help we can give you at that point also said the Puritans we come back to this I'm simply telling you that it was a major pastoral problem and it was a problem on which the Puritans gathered major resources and when we come to 2E on that sheet heading fruits and then E is the doctrine of saving faith you'll see that the fourth line um, under that heading the doctrine of saving faith is faith and assurance and I'm going to say something more structured about the Puritan doctrine of assurance when we get to that point. For the moment, just note that it was a matter on which the Puritans constantly had to be giving pastoral advice to troubled souls. We looked also yesterday at the first reality that's listed under the heading fruits, the concentration on the plan of salvation and method of grace which is characteristic of Puritan theology from first to last. And we looked at Perkins' ocular catechism and I explained to you how it worked. And I invited you to examine at your leisure John Bunyan's ocular catechism, clearly modelled on Perkins, though adapted to his own evangelistic use, um, and the point I wanted you to notice was that though a hundred years separated Perkins from Bunyan, there was really very little difference, if any, in the substance of the doctrine they were putting out. Uh, Perkins, to be sure, has more in his, uh, uh, in, in his um, uh, ocular catechism about... Um, the plan of God and the place of Jesus Christ than Bunyan has. And you may think that that's a strength in Perkins, and I must confess I do. But nonetheless, um, the similarities are more striking than the differences, and Bunyan, at appropriate moments in his writings, shows that he has as much to say about the plan of God and the uh, place of Jesus Christ in it as any of the Puritans. So, note the parallel, um, not the parallel, the um, homogeneity of the Puritan testimony here, and we go on from there. Fruit B, you'll see um, on my sheet, is headed Opposition to Arminianism. Now, at this point, I better had tell you a little about Arminianism. Um, and the first thing to say about it is that it is revisionist Calvinism, or revised Calvinism. And the person responsible for it, a Dutchman named Hermann Zoon, for whom uh, Arminius is the Latin name, um, he began publishing in 1590 um, putting forward his revisionist point of view um, he was not in any way to be um, a, to, 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 to be uh, bracketed with the sort of popular evangelical Arminianism that developed in the 19th century following John Wesley and the evangelical Arminianism that he taught as part of his revival theology. Um, you'll be able to see lines of connection as I tell you about late 16th and early 17th century Arminianism. I'm not denying that they're there, but the spirit of Arminian theology is a moralistic spirit and not in the least an evangelistic spirit. And the original Arminian, Arminianism played down the work of the Holy Spirit 
rather than cracking it up. And that's a very important difference between original Arminianism and um, latter-day 19th and early 20th century evangelical Arminianism, which cracks the spirit up in its own way and is very insistent that without the constant ministry of the spirit, there's no spiritual life. That makes it a very different animal, shall I say, from the cool, rational, even rationalistic Arminianism of Arminius. So, don't make the mistake of supposing that Arminius would have fitted happily into a modern, uh, uh, what shall I say, well, just to make the point, I will say, into a, mo into a modern Pentecostal evangelical church, he wouldn't have. He would have been extremely uncomfortable. Now, what did he say? What he said was that at a number of key points in the Calvinist understanding of the plan of salvation, there was a misstatement. And uh, at five points, he isolated what he thought was uh, a misstatement like this. Man's act of faith, this statement one, should not be described as entirely God's gift in the way that uh, Reformation theology, Lutheran and Calvinist, had done solidly up to 1590. No, what you should say is that man's act of faith at the crucial moment is man's act in such a sense that it's not God's work. God, by his, uh, by his grace, brings people to the, um, the sin-blinded people uh, to the point where now they can put faith in Jesus Christ. But then God stands back and at the crucial moment it is for man to exercise faith on his own. Arminius could never acknowledge that a, an event in the life of a human being, like the act, the series of acts of faith, could also be wholly God's work in them. He thought that the word holy, um, this is W H O L L Y, the word holy in my statement must, in the nature of the case, exclude the authenticity of the act as a human act must, at that, must necessarily reduce the human agent to a robot at that moment um, moved by God and therefore not operating um, in his or her own person ever since Arminius there have been a lot of people in theology who have had a problem at that point but it seems to me that scripture is very clear that we have to accept this as part of the mystery of the creator's interaction with his human creature. Yes, our faith is entirely our act in the psychological sense. We commit ourselves, we embrace Christ Faith is the eyes of the soul seeing Christ and the ears of the soul hearing and receiving his word and the feet of the soul moving towards him and the arms of the soul embracing him and the... Well, <laughs> let's let, well, stop it there. Um, <laughs> the Puritan, some Puritans actually used this image um, which I'm using to stress the fact that uh, yes, faith is 100% a human action but, said the Puritans as the Reformers had said before them faith is also entirely the gift of God and he is to be praised for it and the fact that both ways of looking at the nature of faith are true 
even though it's mystery to us as uh, as to how they fit together. This is a typical example of the mystery that operates constantly, mystery that is in the sense of something unfathomable to our own minds, it operates constantly in all the dealings of God with human beings, not just um, the acts of saving faith. 